to a verse in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 28 and verse 16, where we are told, He that believes shall not make haste. He that believes shall not make haste. Now we read from the book of Ecclesiastes, and we saw there that there were different times for different responses. There was a, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance for joy, a time to keep and a time to cast away and so on. And it is certainly true about these words in Isaiah 28, 16. There is a, a time to make haste, and there is a time to go slow and to consider. So let's start by clearing up some misunderstandings here and think of um, the times when we don't make haste. And you know that if you were drivers on the London roads, you know the penalty that you will have to pay if you break a speed limit. You know when the lights go red, you stop. When the uh, barriers come down at a railway crossing, then you don't try to beat them. You, you obey. When there is a bottle and it says poison on it, you, you put it high in a cupboard and you close the door. Or if there is a, a metal cabinet and it says danger high voltage, you lock it. You make sure that the children can't go in to it. God has given us prohibitions. He's given us ten commandments, hasn't he? And um, we are to pay attention then immediately to these warnings when you stand on the tube station and you're waiting for the tube to come and, and the loudspeaker announcement is, um, please stand away from the platform as a train is coming. Uh, you're not so foolish as to think, well, how near can I go to it without being hit? You respect the warnings, and you stand back. And there are times then, then when, uh, when we, we listen and take warnings very seriously. Uh, uh, this course of action that you are planning to take now in your life, will it grieve the Holy Spirit? Will it help the cause of Christ? Or will it hinder it? And if it's going to hinder, then you don't delay. Um, you know how pornography is so readily available. I heard the testimony of someone who was delivered from it last um, Monday evening. And he said from the age of eight, he became an addict to it. Oh, my friends, please be careful. This isn't a matter of discussion or debate, um, you, you immediately stop these things. It destroyed David, didn't it? It's a very interesting verse, Psalm 119 and verse 60. I made haste and I did not delay to keep your commandments. So um, we, we are um, hasty in... Um, listening to what God says in his word. And when it says to us here in, um, in, in Isaiah, when it says to us, he that believes shall not make haste, it doesn't mean that we are slow or tardy in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with men and, and women. We, we, we are eager to reach out to them you get examples of this in Scripture, don't you? You have Joseph is there and he's become the prime minister of Egypt. And the brothers who have sold him into slavery are there and they want to buy food and he knows them and they don't recognize him. 
and he listens to them, and he weeps over their talk to one another. All this trouble has come to us because of what we did to Joseph, they say. And then he tells them, I'm Joseph. And he speaks to them with a familiar voice and accent and dialogue, and they, this is our brother. And you know what he says? Go home quickly and tell dad that I'm alive. For 20 years, he's broken his heart that I was killed by a wild beast. Tell him you found that he's alive and he longs to see your face. And the brothers hurried home with the good news to their father. You remember again the women at the tomb early in the morning wondering how they're going to move the stone. And when they get there, the stone is rolled away and there's a messenger from God saying, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Go and tell his brethren that he's alive. And we're told they ran through the streets of Jerusalem and knocked on the door and told the 11 apostles there that he has risen from the dead. They ran to do it. Or you remember how the angels appeared to the shepherds um, abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks and told them the Messiah has come. He's been born in Bethlehem and in a stable and you'll find him lying <coughs> in, a, in a manger. And we're told they hurried from the fields and they went into Bethlehem and they went to a stable and they found the baby and Mary and Joseph, and they bowed down and worshipped him. So uh, we are people, and every morning we rise up. It's a new day. This is the day the Lord has made. It's a day of hope. And we say, lead me today. Make me unashamed of the gospel today. Give me opportunities to tell people of the living God, the reality of his love and how he's helped me through my life. <clears throat> we are, are anxious that others should know about it. And so we hasten. We hasten in those ways to spread good news. And then, <clears throat> secondly, we hasten to hear good news, to listen to good news. So <clears throat> we know that there are services on the Lord's Day um, in a certain church where they believe the Bible and they open up the Bible and they teach the Bible and their hymns and their praying and their relationship with one another all reflects this fact that God has spoken to us and he has loved the world and he's given his son and we can have him as our, our Lord and Savior. And where two or three meet in his name, Jesus is there present and so we want to be. So we find out what. Where is a church that believes the Bible? Where is a church that Jesus Christ visits? Where they love him and serve him and do his will. And you make haste. You don't stay for months and years. You sit under the best ministry you can get every Sunday and listen to the word of God and then put it into practice. And God has brought you here tonight because he wants to say, don't haste on some things. But oh, be in a hurry to hear the good news. Let me give you a story about this. There was a king called Nebuchadnezzar. He was a proud man. He was a vain man. And his courtiers were there in Babylon, and they were very envious of his affection for a, a Jewish Old Testament Christian named Daniel, and that he went to him for advice, and he was his Prime Minister, and they hated that. Why didn't he choose one of them? And they hatched a plot so that they could kill Daniel. They said, Lord, you're so good. You're a great and a mighty king. You make it illegal for anyone to pray to anyone else except to pray to you. Oh, well, he was flattered, and he signed the law of the Medes and the Persians, and you know what happened then? They ran, they hurried through the streets, and they came to the apartment where Daniel was, and they caught him in prayer, and they dragged him before the king, and 
Ah, the king realized he'd been caught. His vanity had decided a bad bill. The law of the Medes and Persians, you've signed it. Daniel has to be cast to the lions. And they lift up the trap door and they drop him into the growling mass of lions, hungry lions. And we're told the king had a sleepless night. And early in the morning before dawn, he was up. And a servant came with him and they went to the place where the lions were kept and they lifted up the trap door and he cried out, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God able to shut the mouths of lions? And the voice came back that he knew and loved, O king, live forever. The Lord has sent his angel and he has closed the mouths of lions and I live. The king hurried longing to hear good news. You've come here tonight. Is there a longing in your heart to love Jesus more and to understand his will more? Teach me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy ways. Is that your prayer? As you come here, we are to be abounding in the work of the Lord. We are always to be ready to give a reason for the hope. In days where there's jeopardy and, and carnage on our streets and riots and people are becoming cynical and they say it's hopeless isn't it there's no future for this country but, oh yes oh I have hope why do you have hope and you tell them of the, the God you serve the God who is really in charge the God who can work all things together for the good of those that love him the God who is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You tell them, you are, you are ready. You are ready to speak a word for the Savior. One life we live will soon be past. Only what's done for Jesus will last. So that being, um, not being hasty doesn't mean that we don't heed the warnings of the word of God, but immediately we put them into practice. It doesn't mean that we're slow to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. And then again, um, we, we are to, to be full of zeal to do good works. There's a lovely story, Under the Oaks of Mamre, the old patriarch Abraham was. There was his tent and nothing else around. And one day he sees three men walking towards him and he sees them and looks at them. And they seem majestic men. There's an odor of, of heaven about them, a holiness. They're not like other men. He, he knows they're not crooks or thieves. So he goes to them and he says to them, Please, can I, can I help you? Um, there's no of you to stay, no other buildings, no hotels around here. We'd be glad to give you hospitality. And they say, yes, thank you. We'd love to have hospitality with you. And then we to, we're told, he made haste. And he went to the servants and he said, make fresh bread. And then he stood behind them as they were fed a meal. And uh, he said, would you like more water? Would you like some goat milk to drink? Would you have some more meat here? So we have a freshly uh, butchered goat here, tender. Would you like some more? He's helping them in every way. You remember when um, the good Samaritan, when he saw the wounded, bleeding man lying, he was on a journey and all of us know when we're on a journey, we haven't got time to talk to the Jehovah's Witnesses that are standing there wishing to talk to people and we've got good news to tell them. Or um, we've got an appointment to keep. He stopped. Here's a, a broken man. Here's a bleeding man, a dying man. And we're told immediately he, he stopped. And he healed his wounds. He took wine out and he poured them to disinfect the wound, and then he helped the man to load him 
onto his donkey and he led the donkey to a nearby uh, hotel and he paid for the man to stay there until he grew better again, instantly. Doing good works. We're told um, that we are to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so when he says, don't make haste, he's not talking about uh, any of those things, that we are to be in a hurry to do good works, that we are to be in a hurry to help men and women. So what does it mean then? What's the positive warning here that he who believes is not to be in haste? Well, it's warning us firstly about impetuosity, about being impetuous. It's a great danger. Men perhaps more than women, but women too. We can be impetuous, um, especially if we are weary, especially if we are under pressure. Let me give you an illustration of this. Here is Esau, and Esau is a hunter. And he's taken his bow and arrow, his weapons, his um, javelin, and he's been out in the Middle Eastern sun all day trying to kill a deer or a rabbit, and he's got nothing. And he comes back weary and dehydrated and hungry, and there's a smell of food that his cook brother, that uh, Jacob has, has made. And uh, he says, oh, uh, can you make a, a bowl of, of, of soup for me? And then you remember how Jacob says, if you'll give me your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of soup. He says, well, of course you can have my birthright. And takes the soup and eats it and more and more. He gives up what's enormously precious, being the firstborn and all the rights and the privileges and the legacies that the firstborn has, the authority that he has, and he gives it up. Makes a hasty decision because he's weary and tired. Oh, be careful, my brethren, be very careful about these things. I'll give you another illustration. Moses is delayed for days up on the mountain receiving from the Lord all the laws about worship and about the commandments of God. And the people get more and more restless. He's not there or he's gone. He's not coming back. Let's have a real God. And they turn to Aaron and they say, make a golden calf. And they take off their earrings and their necklaces and they melt it down. And they, they carve a calf of gold, an idol. And Aaron says to the people, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. Can you believe it? Because they were waiting too long. And they were fretful. And they were restless. And so they were vulnerable to idolatry. They made haste. To find another God. We're not to be impetuous. Do you know our Jesus is called a wonderful counselor. And before you act and before you make a decision, you're to go to him and you're to speak to him. And you're to say, What am I to do? You roll it out before him. Lord, this is the situation. I'm under this pressure. What what should I do? Help me now. Give me wisdom. I, I'm, I don't want to make a mistake here. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. He lives. And you are to go to him, and you are to go to him and ask advice before any, any decision. Um, you share with your wife. You share with your husband. A man sweet talks you on the phone. Hello, he said. Um, I, we just got a new company and um, it's doing very well and we can offer 12% now um, if you're thinking of investing any money. Uh, why don't you invest a thousand pounds with us? Uh, 
uh, you'll make a nice profit from it, and but oh, I won't bother you. But uh, um, and so he sweet talks you, you, and he seems so sensible and, and wise. And you invest a thousand pounds. And a month later, he calls again, and how is it gone? Yes, gone well. And you're happy? Yes, I am. Um, you know, the office still open, and uh, we can do. Um, 14% now, uh, if, you, if you invest 10,000, that would make a nice profit. Don't make haste. You don't know this man. You don't know the lies that he is telling. He's a crook. He wants your money. Don't make haste. Talk to your wife. Talk to your pastor. Talk to your bank manager. Be wise. Don't make haste. You've got a boy, and he's a boyfriend, and he's talking to you. He seems all you could want. Nice looking, got a car, got a nice job, and uh, he sweet talks you. You feel crazy about him. You don't know him. You know nothing about his past. You know nothing about his family, his father, his mother. Has he been married before? Is he telling you the truth? Don't make haste. We say, marry at haste. Repent at leisure. Talk to the Lord. Yes, I know loneliness is, is nasty. But being single is far, far better than locked in a, in a bad marriage with a man who abuses you. Oh, think, think twice. Don't make haste, men and women. Um, let me tell you about Sarah. Sarah was the wife of Abraham, and Abraham had a great promise that Sarah was going to get pregnant and that uh, the line would continue and the nations would be blessed through the baby. And the months went by and the years went by. You remember? No baby. No baby. And Sarah was weary of all this. You remember what Sarah said? Let's help God. She didn't use those words, but that's what she wanted to do. She said, sleep with my maid. Sleep with Hagar until she gets pregnant. And then we'll have a son. And then God can work through him, she says. And Abram the fool, he does what Sarah suggests. And Hagar gets pregnant and Hagar gets a baby and Hagar mocks her mistress because she's got a baby and Sarah hasn't. And God is displeased with them. My friends, don't be in haste. Trust God when you've got to wait. When you've got to wait a year. You've got to wait two years. Trust in him. He knows what he's doing, our God. With him a thousand years are like a day and a day like a thousand years. So please put your trust for the future in the living God. Or again, let me say this. There are no shortcuts to evangelism. Salvation is of the Lord. The conception is of the Lord. The new life, the continuance is of the Lord. The consummation is of the Lord. It's of the Lord from the beginning to the end. We are born from above. We live with our hands in the hands of Jesus Christ, and he glorifies us at the end. Salvation from beginning to end is of the Lord. And so, you know, I had three little girls. I could sit the three of them down, and I could say, no, repeat this after me. I, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Um, Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. 
He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. So I come now and give my life to Jesus. So I come now and give my life to Jesus. Right. You're all Christians now. Salvation is of the Lord. There's the kingdom of God. We can't push people into it. We can't do that. God must save and God alone must save. And we must live credible, godly lives before them day by day. And we must reflect the beauties of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit by lives of love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and humility and self-control. And we must occasionally then say a word and always pray for them that God would open blind eyes and God would take out the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. We can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. That's God's grand prerogative. And though we would love to see our children and our grandchildren, our husbands, our wives, our parents, walking with God and trusting in God, it's his prerogative. Thou must save and thou alone. And he loves them far more than we do. So uh, please, no shortcuts. Um, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. That's what we want them to say. Um, there's a wonderful woman called Rosaria Butterfield who was a great unbeliever and was in a relationship with a woman and uh, she wanted to ask some questions to a pastor in the church in, in, in her town, Syracuse. And so she called him and she talked to him and he was very helpful and talked to her. And so she went back to him for advice again and again and she didn't know he was praying for her. Every day he prayed for her. And his wife and he, they would pray for her. And you know, it was two years before he felt now the relationship was so strong and she was trusting him. And so she said, will you? Perhaps you'd like to come to church on Sunday. Yes, I would, she said. And Rosaria went and she never stopped coming. And she came to believe and she put her trust in Jesus and she married a, a preacher and they adopted children and she works for the Lord and serves the Lord and writes books that are so helpful and he appears in debates, the patients. He didn't think the next day he had to make her give a decision. Salvation is of the Lord. Be patient, my friends. Do you know how Satan wanted Jesus to make haste. He interviewed Jesus in the desert. He said, um, how long have you been here now since you left heaven? He says, uh, 31 years. Um, you got many people following you? Uh, I got 12. Oh, 12. What you been doing? I've been helping my, my mother's husband, uh, making shelves and posts and cupboards and doors and window frames. You came from heaven and you spent the last 30 years doing that? Let me tell you now. You want a big crowd following you? I'll tell you what you've got to do. You've got to climb up the temple to the roof. And shout to the people so that there's a great crowd there in, in the court of the temple. And you jump off. God will send a legion of angels. And they'll cut you. And they'll let you gently down to the ground. And people will be amazed. 
and they'll fall before you and worship you and the news of this will spread and all the country will come. They'll know the Messiah has come. That's what you've got to do. That's the way to get a crowd. And Jesus said, man shan't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written, he says. It is written. We don't play tricks. We don't make false claims to attract people. We do the will of God. We resist temptation. Satan makes haste. But Jesus then, he lives with his mother and her children and the man she marries and they live together year after year in a little town on a thorn bush hill with a path in and a path out and everyone knows him and he grows in favor with them, the kindness that he shows, and he does it. And God keeps him there for 30 years, and God keeps you in Hackney. He keeps you. And he has a, a work for you to do in your family, to mum and dad, to your husband, to your wife, to your children, to your neighbors, to this congregation. And you are to be content. It will be enough when we stand before him in the great day and he says, and so with all the blessings I gave you, all the responsibilities I gave you, how did you react? What did you do? I gave you five talents. Did you increase them by five? You didn't hide them in the ground, did you, and bury them? God is testing us telling us not to make haste. Or again, let me say this, there are no shortcuts to being like Jesus. All right? To Christian maturity. There are people who say, well, let your jaw hang down and be loose uh, and babble and a uh, sound will come out of your mouth. And you can increase the volume of it if you, if you keep enough. That means you're full of the Holy Spirit. Would to God it did. There are no shortcuts to praying for your enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do when they're crucifying you. You overcome evil with good. You go the second mile, you turn the other cheek. My friends, that, that takes the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives to affect us, to deliver us from hasty response, to put our fists up, to challenge, to question, to fight. That's not the way of growing like Jesus Christ, is it? You grow in faithfulness in little things. It's only a little thing to email a friend and, and, and thank him or thank her for having you around and for the lovely meal you had or for remembering your birthday or your, your anniversary. Little things. Little things. You, you, you starve the flesh, the flesh is remaining sin and it's powerful and it lusts against the Holy Spirit. And you're not to give it titbits to keep it alive. There, there are awful things on that computer screen that you can see. It's accessible to you. No one else knows. Oh, take care. Don't feed. Don't feed the flesh with what you see the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the mind. Be careful. Um, you know, Jesus works in our lives and he works in our lives by testing us and by picking us up when we fall and by reminding us of how wonderful his grace is 
and that he uses holy people and Christ-like people, and that's the end. Huh? This world is over like a weaver shuttle shoots past the nuts. When I was eight years of age, 80 years seemed an enormous period of time. I tell you, it's a moment. It's gone by. Soon we're going to see him who gave his life for us. Soon we're going to be in his presence. Oh, let's be uh, cautious in strengthening every grace and being willing, if the church asks us to do something, willingly and happily to do it for him. And if there are afflictions, let's learn to say, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Or again, making haste, the great command in the gospel is that we should be contented Christians. And contentment is a grace you learn. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He learned it. It wasn't something that was natural to him. From what we read of in the early chapters of Acts, he was irritable and dynamic and spoke out and acted. If something was wrong, he had to smash it. And then came the Damascus Road and it was an intellectual change because he saw that this Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He was the Son of God. And his irritability didn't immediately go. And his pride and Wrong judgments weren't all immediately corrected. He was a little baby in Christ for the first months and years, but then he learned. He learned. He learned contentment. How did he learn it? Well, perhaps one day he was at a midweek prayer meeting in the local church in Thessalonica, and uh, an old brother there got the Bible out, and he said, let's look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shan't be in want. He said, isn't this wonderful? If the Lord is our shepherd, we're not going to be in want. He's going to lead us by green pastures and still waters, and he's going to restore our souls. And so we can be content. We can say to him, thy will be done. And that's the secret. You know, there are evangelists that come from America and they have a weekend conference and they charge you 500 pounds to make you a better person, to teach you contentment. And here it is, without money, without price. How do I learn to be contented? Because I submit to the Lord's will. I trust in him day by day. Don't be in a hurry. The Lord Jesus is saying this to us. He was never in a hurry, was he? The 30 years he lived in Nazareth, he wasn't in a hurry. And he was always accessible. If a mother had a child to bring to him, he'd bless the child and pray for it and give it back. If they invited him to a wedding, he had time for wedding. He had time for a meal in somebody's house. And when they came to him with their awkward questions, he didn't send them away. He listened and he answered them. The Lord must make us like our Savior, Jesus Christ. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And he, he never ignore you. You're a young Christian and we're so glad to see you here tonight. You're a novice. 
And uh, your life is before you. Imagine you're going to walk through life from now on with the mighty creator. He's your God. He's your savior. Jesus, lover of your soul. He loves you. And he's going to help you. And when you fall, he'll pick you up. And when, as every day, we do the things we regret, he will pardon you. And he will be with you. And he'll humble you in that way and make you more usable. And so we pray. We don't pray, Lord, use me. We pray, Lord, make me usable. Shape me. Mold me. Weaken the flesh in me and increase love and joy and peace in my life. I want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, those are the last words that Peter ever said, that Peter ever wrote. Second Peter chapter 3, that's how it ends. It begins, add to your love kindness, add to kindness brotherly love, add to brotherly love forgiveness, add to forgiveness sweetness of life, add all the time, adding, and then it ends, and grow grow. How do we grow? Well, we grow in inches. I don't see one of my grandsons maybe for three or four months, and then the next time I see him, my, I say, you've grown? How wonderful to see you. He's grown by inches. His parents haven't seen, but I've seen because I'm away and I go. And God who begins a good work in us, doesn't stop. And there are times, of course, when we feel close to him and when we know his blessing on our lives. How wonderful it is to have the nearest nearness of the Lord. But there are other times and um, it's a struggle. And we wonder at times, am I a real Christian? And then we say, is Jesus risen from the dead? Was the tomb empty? Were the lives of those 500 transformed when they saw him? Have the graces that are displayed in my friends in the church, the people I admire the most, are those phony? Or are they genuine? and real. And you talk to yourself. You preach to yourself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God now. Come on. Come on. Get on with your life. You know there's no one like Jesus. And he's your Lord and Savior. Don't be in a hurry to go elsewhere, to run after this, to run after that. Don't make haste if you believe in Jesus Christ. Be still and know that he is God. Amen. Lord, we bow before thee and we, we want to be these things. We want to hurry to do good things, to share the good news, to tell other people. And we want to eagerly listen to the word of God where we can have it preached to us week by week. We want to be growing Christians, Lord. We want to use every possible means of Christian maturity. And then, oh Lord, we don't want to make haste. We don't want to be trapped by crooks speaking sweet talk on the phone. We We don't want to decision people into making false professions of faith. We want to grow in knowledge. We don't want to take any shortcuts. Lord, we we want your will to be done. So please help us. Please help us to trust you more and submit to your will day by day. Please grant that. Hear our prayers. Because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.